So you think the, the time in D.C. is sufficient with this, four, I guess it's the four day or three day and then the weekend situation? And Yeah, I, I think ideally you would have five full days. Yeah, because I think I recall that's what you discussed as being more ideal yeah. is with a couple I, weeks on and one week off. Yeah, I think a middle ground is what we have right now, which is basically a four day work week. Because, yeah, you know, members and fewer and fewer members live in DC with their families. That, that was the case back, you know, what we all yearn for is, is a time where members broke bread together, they were bipartisan, they were collegial, you know, all of that. Well, a lot of them lived here. Um, and, you know, there were friends outside of Congress, but that also created a disconnect with districts you know, they weren't going home very much. They were creatures of Washington and part of the Tea Party movement. And this is a lot of the congressional schedule reforms were put into place going into 2011 was this backlash from the districts that we don't know our congressmen. We don't know our congresswoman. There's no interaction here. You are out of touch with us. And so we were trying to put back um, a, a sense of connection with uh, members districts, or at least give them the opportunity to make that connection, whether they took it or not. And you have to recognize that members now primarily do not live here in DC. Most of them live back in their districts. And so they are commuting. Well, if that's a fact that they're living in their districts in their community, you need to make some time in the schedule for that commute to happen. You know, there, there are members who represent Alaska. There are members who represent rural parts of Washington state, except it takes them a day of travel. That's not really possible with a two day weekend. Um, hence why four day work weeks are, are more common here. Three day uh, weekends allow for that, that commuting. So then if you think that that system works pretty well, maybe we move then to the committee side where you say there's overlap, right? Because you hear complaints about multiple committees being scheduled for the same time, et cetera. You know, how does that schedule get worked out? Is there some kind of, I mean, I would think there'd be some kind of like, you know, software that would automatically schedule the least number of concurrent meetings for members or something like that. And I'm sure you're gonna tell me there's no such software. There's no such software. There's no such thought either. Um, the committees are left to their own devices on when they schedule. And there's uh, there's not even coordination between two committees. I see that you're holding a hearing next Thursday at this exact same time. Could we maybe work on... No, there's none of that either. Mem uh, the chairman set their committee schedules and, and that's what they go by. And, you know... Uh, whether one of their committee members is on another committee that has a hearing at that same time or not, you know, no matter. And there's no, no there's, so there's no centralized process and then there's no communication between the committees really um, to any large extent. Um, and that's what's needed. I think some centralization of the committee scheduling, you don't have as much of a problem on the Senate side. You have a huge problem on the House side, 435 members, the committees have grown and grown and grown over the years. So they have many more members on each of these committees than we did before. We also have many more committees too. You know, the Department of Homeland Security, which is a creation post 9-11. So now we have a Homeland Security Committee. Um, things have, committees jurisdictions have been carved up over the years and, and shared across, across each other. Um, and subcommittees have expanded as well. So all of that, has created this web and this mess of committee schedules. And it, it makes for a very ineffective process. Ultimately, what I think it does is it dumbs down the membership. You don't have um, you know, a lot of policy expertise amongst the members because they're just not spending time um, studying these issues as much as, as perhaps they should. Right, so in terms of the the leadership offices, as we were mentioning, you know, another key piece of the leadership office is the rules. Um, and I don't know how much you've interacted with the rules side of things. And how does that process work between the leader and the rules committee? 
Um, well, the the rules committee is technically the speaker's committee, and there are a few committees that um, members are appointed by the speaker or the min more minority leader too, and the rules committee is one of them. But you really think of the rules committee as an arm of the speaker, uh, which means the speaker is directing the rules committee um, to change a piece of legislation informed by the whip process, informed by the agenda that the majority leader has come up with. Um, the speaker is then um, um, directing the rules committee to help effectuate that in terms of debate and consideration on the house floor. Um, and, and the rules of the house really are the purview of the speaker as well you know, the rules package that is introduced at the start of every Congress on opening day, that's something that is, is headed up by the speaker in the speaker's office. Um, so I think about the rules for the House, which are really, um, you know, it's just precedent that is built upon itself over the years. The base rules um, are adopted, you know, easily from one Congress to another. It's just small tweaks that are be being made at the beginning of each Congress, but the House is not a continuous body, so it has to reconstitute itself, unlike the Senate, every two years. So it's a necessary step, uh, but it's rather perfunctory. Um, but it, you know, it goes down to um, sort of the institutional aspect of the Speaker's office as well, where uh, the Speaker is responsible for appointing all of the House officers. You know, the House parliamentarian is appointed by the Speaker, uh, the Clerk of the House, um, the Sergeant at Arms, the CAO, and so on. Um, the parliamentarians are uh, figuring out the jurisdiction for any piece of legislation that's introduced on the House floor. The parliamentarians are, are weeding through the rules of the House to figure out whose jurisdiction this bill is. And is it split apart? Well, the Speaker is then moderating that debate internally in the parliamentarian's office. They actually have their floor staff um, officed with the parliamentarian staff. Um, and they're saying, you know what, if, if we're gonna do a, um, a sequential referral on this uh, piece of legislation, we're gonna give this committee 30 days to mark it up. And we're gonna give this committee 15 days to mark it up. That's a decision that's not made by the parliamentarian. They decide, you know, they're they're interpreting the rules, um, but the speaker's office is ultimately the referee. At the and is the speaker micromanaging, you know, each bill that comes through, or is it just the important ones, or how does that process work? Just the important ones. I, you know, if you went on to Congress.gov right now and looked at how many bills have been introduced just this Congress, and we've only been up and running for just over three months now, it's thousands, um, and. 95% of it will never see the light of day um, on the floor, much less in committee. I mean, certainly I'm not going to um, get a markup. So uh, their time is not spent on the majority of that. that that's the parliamentarian's office just kind of churning through pieces of legislation that are introduced for whatever reason by the rank and file. Um, really, it's the important pieces of legislation going back to the discussion about the majority leaders setting the agenda for the House, that group, that cluster of bills or um, specific subjects, um, that's really what the speaker is getting involved in. And so for the, ultimately when it comes to the floor, how is that negotiated with the leader? I mean, obviously the leader, the speaker, I should say, wants to have certain things, you know, certain core pieces, that's their ambition, right? And right. then, there's going to be a lot of other stuff that maybe they know something about or don't care about. How does that, how does that, you know, pass or not pass through the floor? Um, there's a discussion always uh, within the leadership and usually um, on the Republican side, we call it the big four. If we're in the majority, that's speaker, leader, whip and conference chair. And it also includes, um, uh, the chief deputy whip. Democrats, it's similar on their side. Um, generally, you're having um, smaller sort of retreat-like meetings towards the end of a year, beginning of year, when you're really trying to, to nail that down that agenda for the year. Um, 
Congress, Congress thinks in terms of, of that schedule, that annual schedule. And it's not so much about these big ideas that we're gonna, it's gonna take six years to get done or 10 years to get done. It's what do we wanna do this coming year? We know the president's budget comes up in February. We know uh, we've got, we're gonna try to pass a budget in March or April. We know the appropriations process is gonna start in earnest in May and run through July at the very least. And then we've got you know all these expiring things um, that go boom throughout the year that we've got to deal with. Layer on top of that, what are the the three or four big ticket items that we could hope to get done uh, this year or this Congress? In the case of Democrats right now, it's COVID relief. It's um, this big infrastructure push. Whether it's DC voting or something on immigration or anything, you know, there are 20 other gun control, there are 20 other issues that they're thinking about and that they're going back and forth on internally in these leadership meetings. Do we, you know, all of, all of our effort is going to be focused on infrastructure now from now until probably the August recess. What, what are the other two issues that we want to be pushing right now? And that's a discussion that's going on between the speaker and the leader and the whip. Great. Well, let's move on to another subject, which is personnel. So obviously you've been in a number of different positions in Congress. You've hired people, you've managed them. How has that evolved over time? Is it, you know, how do you go about hiring the right people, managing them and making sure you have the right amount of resources in each of these offices? Well, the resource question is is uh, a big question today because I think congressional staff is underpaid um, and <clears throat> more resources need to be to be given um, to the congressional staff. You, I, I think there's been a bit of a brain drain on the Hill over the last 10 years or so as a result of, of the recession, but it's still there today. Um, so that needs to be addressed. But... <clears throat> um, there are sort of three segments of personnel. Um, they're the personal offices. So a member and their personal congressional staff um, that are basically there to serve the district and to serve the constituents of the member's district or state. Um, then there's committee staff and these are highly professionalized policy es- experts in very um, you know, broad range of issues, but getting down to a very, very detailed level. And ultimately, they're overseeing the agencies for which they have jurisdiction of. So um, a, prof- uh, a personal office staff can be very young, probably average age, especially on the House side, is going to be the mid-20s. In a committee, it's going to be um, much more seasoned, um, at least in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. Uh, and then there's leadership staff, um, which is what I was. Um, that's sort of a mix of the two. Um, your constituents are the conference or the caucus. That's who elected you to that leadership position. That's who you serve. So as a staffer in a leadership office, I'm not, in the case of Eric Canner's office, I wasn't answering to the, um, the voters or the constituents of uh, Virginia 7. I was answering to the 200 and some odd members of the House Republican Conference. That was, you know, your sole mindset. And so it, it's more of a blend of political tacticians um, and um, deep policy experts too, because you're managing the committee process in case of the leader's office, or, um, you know, you're trying to uh, find those, those policy pieces to push and pull in the case of the whip operation. So maybe not quite as seasoned as committee staff, but highly political, um, very strategic um, type of staff. Um, so you've got those three tranches. Um, I think, you know, in the case of, of the Hill writ large, I, it is one of the true meritocracies in Washington on the personnel side. The cream truly rises to the top. It is um, a fast paced, a place to work. Um, and there is lots and lots of turnover as a result of elections taking place every two years for the House, six years for the Senate. 
Um, but just in the case of putting a lot of highly ambitious, highly motivated, smart people together in basically a, a college campus type environment, the Hill is a campus to itself. Um, and that creates, you know, um, a lot of camaraderie, a lot of collaboration, close quarters, um, close relationships. Um, um, it really does have that feel of sort of a college type atmosphere. Um, but um, again, cream rises to the top. Um, and it's, it's one of those work environments that I've always recommended to folks who are interested in politics because it, it does seem to continue always to be a meritocracy up there. So how is performance judged, right, uh, by the manager in that case? Because it seems the jobs are very different, maybe even ha very hard to measure in terms of the outcomes, right, of a staffer. I, I think the outcomes are more measurable in terms of, of, of numbers on the personal office level, because um, you're not really looking for whether legislation, begin of course, a member wants to have their pet piece of legislation become law. So you're measuring sort of on that success, but mostly you're measuring on how much mail did we get on any given, you know, uh, day or month or week and how good at we were we at responding to that mail and getting responses out the door. So there are like some very measurable things in a personal office. When you get to a committee or a leadership office, it becomes much more amorphous and ultimately it's, What's the political success of this office in the case of a leadership office? And is my staff helping me achieve that? Um, in the case of a, a leader of a committee office is um, how much legislation are we churning out? How successful are we in so doing? Um, so very different ways to measure the success of each of those. I, ultimately though, I do think there's some similarity in that um, you can recognize talent fairly easily throughout all walks of life. And um, you can recognize hard work. And both of those are, are appreciated on the Hill and are, are, are generally rewarded. Great, well, I think it's time for us to move on to our the questions I ask all of our guests. We call it our lightning round of questions uh, so that later on we can compare the answers of our various uh, guests on the program. So are you ready to move on to the lightning round? I'm ready to move on to the lightning round. All right. Fire. First one is, what do you think congressional representation should mean? I think it truly should mean that um, you represent the people who elect you um, and that you're uh, accountable to them. Um, now that creates a lot of tension and um, um, in this divisive environment we're in. But if you represent Southwest Texas, um, I think you should um, carry their views up here to DC and vice versa. If you represent Brooklyn, New York, you should represent their views up here to DC. So when you say carry their views, do you mean, um, you mean submit bills that reflect those views or do you mean they should make those views known? You know, are they representing the beliefs of this district when they vote or are they exercising their own judgment? I think there, um, there's a little bit of a gray area there. I think it, it's probably skewed these days a little bit more towards, we're just impersonating our constituents um, in their you know, exact image up here. And there's no middle ground. Um, in the case of years gone by, it was, I don't really care that much about what my constituents think. I'm more interested in my portrait hanging in the Rayburn office building, and I'm going to um, exercise my own judgment in these, in these issues, irrespective of, of what they think. So there's a middle ground to be had. Um, I'm not sure. It, um, I don't know when that middle ground has been had. But you think the middle ground is the place that makes the most, that is the way it should be, I should say. Yes, yes, yeah. Great. Next one is, uh, and we've talked about this already, but uh, you can rehash your answer or elaborate on it, which is how would your ideal Congress allocate its time? 
I, I think the majority of the time should be spent in committees in a constructive manner, not just, you know, hauling in CEOs so that um, it's a high profile hearing that, you know, is, is shown wall to wall on CNN and, and the rest of the cable shows. Um, but that the, the majority of the work should be done in the committees. It should try to be bipartisan. There are a few committees that still act in that way. And the best example are the House and Senate Armed Services Committees. Those are bipartisan committees. The staff is very bipartisan um, and they produce things. They produce their annual authorization bill every year for the past over a, cent over a half century. They've produced it every year. That's how it should work. Um, it, it's not the case in the majority of committees now, which is why I do think a lot of scheduling reform um, needs to be prioritized to, to help in that. So, deficit. so if we could just go back a little bit, it's you like the four days or, or five days for two weeks and then back home that that mix, the current mix you think is acceptable. And then just the only area that really needs in, in you know, that could be moved in your mind is a better coordination of the committee work in the mornings. Yeah, I think so. I think two to three weeks in session in a row, followed by at least one week back in districts for members to hear from those constituents, better represent them up in here in DC is the right. And, you know, whether it's four days in or five days in, in a work week, yeah, I, I think there's some flexibility there. Ideally, you would be at five days. But if you go beyond having members in session, for more than three weeks, bad things happen. Um, the, the, the place needs to be aired out after three weeks, in my opinion. Very interesting. And just to a last nitpick here is on the campaigning versus working. So I'm assuming when you're, when you talk about they're in DC working committee or on the floor, that's time spent legislating or working on oversight as compared with campaign kinds of activities or fundraising. Right. That, but that goes on at the same time, um, just because they can't do that in the Capitol or on the Capitol grounds doesn't mean they're not doing that through the course of their their daily routine when they're here in D.C. All they have to do is go across the street and they can make fundraising phone calls or they can go to a fundraising lunch or breakfast or dinner. And their schedules when they're here in D.C. are, are just that they are doing a, a breakfast, a lunch, a dinner, and then maybe a couple coffees or or um, happy hours in between for the purposes of fundraising from the PAC community here in DC. When they're back home, they're doing a different type of fundraising um, and a different type of campaign. Um, but that that is a part of both schedules, the DC schedule and the district schedule. Right. And so I guess in your my question is around that time, what do you you know, do you think that that amount of time is appropriate on the fundraising or should that be cut out while they're in D.C. and they should be hanging out with other members, you know, talking about legislation or oversight or the ball game? I, I think the more time you can have the members around each other legislating, the better. <clears throat> but we're also not going to. And I think uh, time has shown this and the courts have shown this. We're not going to legislate or um, um, use judicial activism um, to prevent members from campaigning and fundraising. It's just that that is, it's not the law and that's not the constitution. Um, so that's always going to exist. How do you work around that effectively? Um, I think is the question. And um, I, in some ways, um, the changing dynamics of politics is already moving the needle a little bit in one way. The, you know, just after January 6th, the PAC community has turned itself off, has pressed pause to both parties, but in particular, 147 House Republicans um, who voted against certification of the election results, either in Arizona or Pennsylvania or both. Um, that means that daily fundraising activity isn't taking place right now. And there are a lot of members who instead are fundraising online through small dollar. It was started on the Democratic side very effectively um, back during Barack Obama. 
Um, and the Republicans have now caught up to it. You know, someone who's as controversial as a Marjorie Taylor Greene just announced that she had raised um, $3 million over the last quarter. Uh, that's someone who is a pariah to the, the PAC community and will never get a PAC dollar. Um, and she's able to raise it from small dollar contributions instead. I think that's where we're gonna be moving more and more. The business community and Republicans or Democrats, I think they're having more and more of a tenuous relationship. So the PAC fundraising element, which is what drives the campaigning time here in DC, I think is going to start to, um, um, to it's already slowed, but I, I think, I think it's going to go not completely away, but it's going to subside. All right. Next question is how should debate deliberation or dialogue occur or be structured in Congress? Well, the most productive debate dialogue uh, would be not in front of the cameras. And unfortunately, uh, you know, C-SPAN is a great thing, uh, but it's also created these actors on the House floor. There's no actual debate that's going. This isn't, you know, John Quincy Adams down there. Um, this is members reading from talking points and um, looking at the camera. Um, which is why I'm sure the Supreme Court is, is loath to, to bring cameras into their chambers. Um, I think the best debate and the best conversations between members happens off camera, just like anything. You know, when the cameras turn off, and you're doing an interview, we're gonna have a much more easy conversation and we're gonna be more productive. Um, reformers always talk about things needing to be done out in the open, in sunlight, you know, being transparent. Well, transparency creates this, this hyper-partisan divisive environment we're in right now. And a lot of more productive things happen behind closed doors when the public isn't watching, not because you're trying to hide something from the public, but if you've got, you know, a thousand cooks in the kitchen, you're not gonna, you're not gonna produce a great meal. Yeah, and that's one thing that might be moving, you know, all, a lot of that private conversation moves to leadership or moves to the party when you can't do it in committee or you can't do it on the floor, right? The, the power may migrate towards those private areas. Yeah, and, and um, it, it's exacerbated these crisis moments that we've had. So now we legislate those those private conversations that are kicked up to the leadership level. Well, the leadership's not really talking to each other. Nancy Pelosi and Kevin McCarthy don't have a great relationship. They're not getting behind closed doors and hammering things out. The only time they are is when they absolutely have to because the debt limit's about to be breached or there's a fiscal cliff or there's a pandemic, you know? We are negotiating crisis to crisis right now um, because of these polarized times. And so this, this kind of area where people can do this dialogue, would it be in the committees with closed doors in your mind, or would it be closed door yes. floor sessions? What are your, what are the ways you think it could happen? I don't, uh, um, I will never go. There are a few avenues um, towards having a closed door session on the floor, but that's usually for national security reasons. Um, I, I don't ever envision the house chamber becoming this great, um, delivered or the, you know, the Senate chamber is a little bit better in this regard, but neither of them are going to become these great deliberative bodies anymore. Um, I think the place where it can, in bits and bites, where you can start regaining some of that is at, at the committee level. And, you know, it's, it's a chairman and a ranking member working together behind the scenes or a few members of the committee working together across the aisle behind the scenes, but not while the cameras are on. Great. Next question is, uh, what fundamental institutional improvement should Congress make within 50 years? Uh, well, we've probably talked about one of them, which is, is figuring out the committee schedules um, for sure. I, I, I think a general um, um, refocus on civics and civic education is something that's important both to the Congress, but then also to the country um, in primary and secondary um, 
um, learning environments. Uh, I, I think that has, we have a, um, a, a gap in civics education in my mind, and it bleeds into the kind, you see that in the Congress as members get here now, um, that there's not as much education. So I think a, a refocus and a recommitment to policy, policy issues um, and civics. And um, it, it, in some regards, it's too late by the time the members get here. So you have to start young. Um, so that's what I would say is start young with civics education in this country. Right. Next one is what book or article most shaped your thinking with respect to congressional reform? I don't have a, a ready-made answer here. I will say um, that I'm currently reading a great book um, about James Baker, um, the man who ran Washington, uh, which is a fascinating look at the way Washington used to work, uh, but also speaks to that need for the conversations between the parties, between the members, um, happening behind closed doors. He was the ultimate political operator, much like an LBJ was, um, and there's countless others throughout the years. I can think of all of the great chairmen and chairwomen um, of the 90s and 2000. You know, you still had chairmen serving um, in the Democrat majority of uh, 2007 to 2010, who had been chairman back in the previous Democrat majority um, pre-1994. Um, and they were serious legislators. Um, and I, I think my takeaway from that book um, that I'm currently reading is um, you know, there's still there's still a way to do that. There are still the James Bakers of the world who are out there. Uh, we need more of them. Um, and we, we need dialogue behind the scenes. Great. Well, the last one is, um, you know, about your future. What do you plan? Is it the private sector? Are you interested to go back to the, to the rough and tumble of Congress? You know, what is your long-term plan? Uh, my long-term plan is to keep doing exactly what I'm doing, which I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a lobbyist. Uh, I have, we have a, a nice life here in DC. Um, I like to do some things outside of that day-to-day -day job. I, I serve on a, a few boards at UVA. Um, um, I'm interested in, uh, um, in a startup right now that um, is sort of a legislative search startup um, that is free to, to congressional staff that I think it will be a, a great learning tool for them, helping them redline bills. Um, and then ultimately, yeah, I still do have the itch to go back to Congress. Ultimately, it's, it's nicer to be a decision maker than to, to report on the decisions that are being made. I'm, I'm not unlike a journalist in that I'm reporting on decisions that have already been made um, to my clients, helping them change the outcomes of those decisions, but ultimately um, just passing on information. Um, it would be nice to be back in the role of decision maker. And so I could see myself going back in at some point uh, once life is a little bit easier on the home front. Great. Well, Kyle, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, glad to do it. Good to be with you.